The diagnosis of insulin resistance means the rules have changed in your body. You gain fat effortlessly, and what might have worked to keep fat off in your younger years no longer works. Can you reverse insulin resistance once and for all? Hi, I'm Dr. Eric Westman, and welcome to my channel where I review and debunk nutritional information online. Thanks for sending this video to review. This one is from Dr. Annette Bosworth, or Dr. Boz, as she calls herself, B-O-Z. She's a very popular influencer. I got to meet Dr. Boz and her husband on a low-carb cruise some years ago, and very nice uh, folks, I have to say. And let's see what she says about how to reverse insulin resistance. And, and wait till you come to the end of the video, because I'm not going to be so strict as she has you think you have to be, but to each his own, right? So let's see what Dr. Boz has to say. Confused by all the information out there about the keto diet? In my online course, Keto Made Simple, I'll teach you a safe, simple, clinically proven way to do it. In fact, you'll learn the same exact approach I've been teaching my patients for over 25 years. No macros, no weighing and measuring food, no special gadgets or apps, just a straightforward and uncomplicated approach that will help you lose weight, improve your blood sugar and blood pressure, crush cravings, control your hunger, and feel your best. Visit AdaptYourLifeAcademy.com to learn more and to enroll. The diagnosis of insulin resistance means the rules have changed in your body. You gain fat effortlessly, and what might have worked to keep fat off in your younger years no longer works. Luckily, the new rules do not require Navy SEAL level discipline or an exercise routine. Reversing insulin resistance takes these three rules. Number one, track insulin, not calories. You may have heard the rebuttal that your body does not count calories. and it's true, but it does not make you unaccountable. Instead of obsessing on calories in versus calories out, we need you to focus on how much insulin your body is producing. Your body needs just one equation to be true to put fat onto your body. It needs to have an elevated insulin while consuming food. Yeah, so I, I, I like that. that. But how do you measure insulin, right? You don't have the measures like we can for glucose and ketones. But the main point that is very important here, it's the metabolism that matters. You want to eat to lower the insulin level. It doesn't matter what the color of the food is. It doesn't matter if it's a rainbow or a pyramid or a shape. I mean, these are all kind of human constructs. The biology, biochemistry tells us that you want your insulin low and that reverses insulin resistance. Spot on. The presence of insulin tells your body to put that energy into liver, muscle, or fat cells. If you eat a bunch of food and your insulin doesn't rise or barely moves at all, we call that type 1 diabetes. Type 1 diabetics actually fall victim to an eating disorder called diabulimia. They purposely manipulate their insulin dose and under-deliver the dose. When they do this, it makes it impossible to store energy as fat. You can imagine how tempting it would be to eat anything you want and not gain any fat. But this eating disorder is deadly. Their body is starving from the inside of their cells out. They can metabolize no glucose and can only live off of fat. Once those fat storages are empty, they literally die of a ketoacidosis process, a form of extreme malnourishment. So for those of you injecting insulin, this video is not for you. Well, and you have type 1 diabetes. So if you're injecting insulin and you have type 2 diabetes, your doctor might have even said that you had insulin-dependent diabetes. You don't. The, much to the surprise of the insulin researchers who were able to actually do a radio immunoassay in the 1970s. This was all retold in Dr. Gary Taubes, not Dr. Gary Taubes' book, Rethinking Diabetes. When the type 2, so the overweight adults with elevated blood glucoses, when they had their insulin level checked for the first time, the insulin level was high. So if you're type 2, you already have high insulin levels and giving more insulin levels doesn't, going more insulin doesn't make sense. 
to an endocrinologist, if you have a hormone, if the hormone's low, you want to raise it. If the hormone's high, you want to lower it, not give more of the hormone. And that's where the treatment of type 2 diabetes got messed up and perpetuating the, the insulin re resistance. Basically, you don't fix it by giving more insulin. And that's all in Gary Taubes' book called Rethinking Diabetes. It, now, like most of Gary's books, it's, it's a pretty full of science sort of book. So, but uh, if you had any question here, what she means is if you have type 1 diabetes, you're going to have to stay on insulin, but not type 2. But for the rest of us, it illustrates that insulin is not necessarily the enemy, but it's something we're making way too much of. And as a result, we're plumping up all of those fat cells. Unfortunately, insulin is very volatile and sends you back and forth to the lab several times before I know exactly what it's doing. We'll get to estimating your insulin here in a minute, but for now, I want to arm you with the knowledge of what makes insulin rise, causing you to store fat. The types of food matter. Carbs cause the highest spike in insulin, whereas protein causes a lesser spike and fat causes the lowest spike in insulin. So that means we're eating fat first and a lot of it. Don't look at the calorie count. Remember, when you're consuming high fat, that metabolism starts to hike up. Not only does it have the lowest production of insulin, but it's the best return on energy per bite. Eating fat has the lowest amount of insulin produced. And when you consume fat in a low insulin state, it really boosts the metabolism. Again, you need the insulin to store it as fat. Without that insulin, you get to use it as energy. And that's how metabolisms get boosted on a high fat diet. Years of chronically elevated insulin will take years to reverse. So stay focused on the high fat. We'll shift focus later on in this story. Well, so if you're, if you're not in the low carb or keto community and this is your first video that you're watching, you could get very confused. And many of my patients are by the focus on fat in the food. No, protein comes first. And, and I'm, I know Dr. Boz pretty well, and I know she she's, believes that too. We're made of protein. So there really, if there's one thing to eat, it's not fat, <laughs> even, even on a keto diet, especially if you're trying to lose your body fat, but it's protein. And I think what she's trying to do is get rid of the, the fear of fat and maybe have you try to focus a little, maybe too much on the ketone level, but protein comes first. So let's put it to the extreme. If all you did is eat fat, you would whittle away because your body needs protein to make its own structural components and fight immunity and all that. So if, if you're fine tuning your keto diet, it may be that, you know, you still keep eating low carb and keto, but you change the macronutrients a little bit to get ketosis or maybe even a little more fat loss. This is an individual thing that you can do. But if, if you're just coming to the low carb world, the emphasis really is on protein. Protein comes first. I've done experiments where I've added a quarter cup of MCT or medium chain triglycerides. And although I had added 500 calories to the day, I lost weight because of that boosted metabolism in the presence of the reduced insulin production. So eat the fat, keep those carbs low, under 20 grams per day. Number two, don't eat after dark. The timing of those fat-based meals has a profound impact on your insulin production. Remember that even fat produces a little bit of insulin and so does the consumption of protein, as well as waking up in the morning. That morning rise of cortisol where your brain intuitively knows that the sun is rising sends a stimulus to your liver where the production of glucose enters your body. And this spike in glucose results in a spike in insulin if you're insulin resistant. We want to front load those meals earlier in the day. Put that consumption of food in the daylight hours, the closer to sunrise, the better. Eating after sunset has a higher cost to those with insulin resistance. Well, so I'm not quite so certain, <laughs> or, or should I say I don't require people to do that, and, and a lot of people won't have to do that, and it, it will still work. But it, I, so what I, I see here, Dr. Boz has a certain technique, which is great. I mean, I, I think it works for a lot of people, scientifically sound. And then the fine tuning here, I'm, I'm not quite sure if it's based on her experience or her clients who are, are telling her information, but the, I think there's more flexibility. 
like a lot of people like Dr. Fung, other practitioners who have, or like mine, where I have a keto made simple sort of brand where I don't ask people to do ketone measurements, that sort of thing. I think these all work. And, and they're, they're, you choose the one that works for you. And if you find it difficult to not eat before bedtime, don't throw the whole thing out because you just can't do that one little thing and realize that there's a lot of flexibility to the way one can do a low carb keto diet. The longer you get between your last bite of food and the time you go to bed, the better your insulin will be the next day. And number three, we have to measure it if we want to change it. If we want these rules to stick, we must measure the metrics so we can study the improvements. Earlier, I said the measurement of insulin is messy, and indeed it is. It's very volatile. So the best proxy for insulin is to measure the two molecules that it controls the most that being glucose and ketones. Measuring glucose and ketones at the same moment helps us use that metric in combination to predict what your insulin is. We call this the Dr. Boz ratio, a derivative of the GKI or glucose ketone index. The Dr. Boz ratio uses the glucose divided by the ketones and the lower the Dr. Boz ratio, the lower the insulin. The best part of using this proxy to insulin is it also measures the impact on insulin. This is something I can't do in one check of insulin, but I can do when I look at what your glucose and ketones are doing over time. The best time to measure this metric is first thing in the morning. There's less noise in your data when you wake up in the morning and measure those two points of information. Use those to track how is your insulin doing after last night's sleep. Well, I, I like the style. I, I like the, the basic messages. You heard the keep the carbs under 20 total grams and the emphasis on checking ketones and, and the G or the BAS ratio. I, I don't find that that's so important. There are a lot of people who get messed up. There are a lot of people who get messed up because the numbers don't correspond to the the weight loss or diabetes or metabolic reversal. So the, sometimes the ability to measure gets a little bit ahead of the, the knowledge of how to best use it. You certainly don't have to measure all these things other than keeping the carbs low, you're measuring that. The, the whole low carb keto process worked before you could measure these things. If you're using that on to incrementally adding, adding if you're adding glucose and ketone measurement on to enhance the, the adherence to make you stay on it better, fantastic. The fine tuning of it to see if there's incremental benefit beyond, I don't know, beyond just keeping the carbs super low. I don't have evidence for that yet. The, although maybe, the, maybe it's there. Dr. Baz, how about putting together 50 people of uh, assembling that information in a way that we can see how much benefit really is gained by adding on the glucose and ketone measurements? That'd be an interesting study to do. And I know a lot of people in my area, well, maybe there's a selection bias. People come to me because I say pretty publicly that you don't have to do all that Certainly you can, and Dr. Boz will support you if you want to do all of that kind of measurement. Is there incremental benefit beyond, uh, you know, do you have to do that? I don't know. I don't, I'm not sure that it's, uh, what is the bang for the buck, so to speak, metabolically or, or for longevity? I think the jury's still out, but we need, we need to know. We need to have studies on ketone measurements and ketone levels and see if there's better metabolism and better outcomes over time. It's a great study to do. Hope you like the video. If you like, please like, subscribe, ring the notification bell. I'm putting out new information on Wednesdays and Fridays. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell, and check out adapterlifeacademy.com.